Hello Gothlets and welcome to this week's episodes of Stories to Fall Asleep To. This week I am continuing with the Ancient Egyptian series and we're going to be discussing Amit and the afterlife. Um, depending on how long this takes, it might be a two-parter with the end of the afterlife one or I might just do an extra long podcast. I have taken some of the aspects from last week's podcast um, where I played about with some AI and introduced some of the parts that I liked into this week's. I've used several quotes during this as well and all the sources, um, you'll be able to find them in the descriptions. Most of them are taken from books. Um, I thought let's go for the book route instead of the website route. So, grab yourself a drink, get comfortable, and we shall begin. Today we embark on a journey back in time to explore the enigmatic world of ancient Egyptian mythology. Our spotlight today shines on a lesser known deity, yet one of the great significances in the afterlife. The goddess Amit. So to unravel the mysteries surrounding Amit, we must first understand her creation and her place in the pantheon of ancient Egyptian gods. And I don't know why, but my voice is going, so we'll just put up with it. Normally it corrects itself, so I do apologise if you have a hard time hearing me. According to ancient Egyptian mythology, Amit, also known as the Devourer, emerged during the creation of the world and we've been over the creation with Ra um, and Atum and all of that good stuff. So I have found the source and it's from the complete Gods and Goddesses of Ancient Egypt and it's by Richard H. Wilkinson. So Wilkinson notes, quote, Amit was formed during the union of the gods Ra Anubis and Osiris, representing the essential elements of creation and the cosmic forces that governed life and death in ancient Egypt." End quote. So going from this, there's not much I could find about an actual creation myth for Amit, and I do like to add those for the gods. So come up with a hypothetical creation myth for Amit based on the general themes found in ancient Egyptian mythology. You'll see where I'm going. So in the beginning, when the cosmos was still in its chaotic state which we've been over, the great gods Ra, Anubis and Osiris came together in divine union. Make of that what you will, but obviously Ra and Anubis are male, or Anubis kind of you know, that androgynous kind of thing. And Osiris is female. Sounds like a fun party going on. So, from this cosmic convergence emerged a being of profound significance, born from the essence of creation itself. This celestial union gave rise to Amit, the goddess with a fearsome form destined to play a pivotal role in the act of. So Amit had the head of a crocodile, the front legs of a lion, the hindquarters of a hippopotamus, and we've mentioned this before in Anubis and Ra, I think we've mentioned that before. So she symbolised the convergence of the powerful forces that governed life and death in the ancient Egyptian worldview. Her creation represented the necessary balance between the divine order, which is the Ma'at, and the unpredictable nature of existence. And one thing we have learned throughout this series is that ancient Egyptians did like this balance and the understood balance. Good didn't prevail overall, neither did evil. They needed, you know, that in their lives. As the gods marvelled at their creation, they bestowed upon Amit a sacred duty. She was to become the guardian of the scales of judgment in the afterlife. 
and we'll go more into that um, in this podcast. Standing beside the mighty God Anubis. A lot of depictions. I will say there's a bit edited out because that came out wrong. Think of it what you will. She is beside Anubis as kind of a guard dog role. Amit's role was to ensure that the souls of the deceased faced a fair and just assessment of their earthly deeds. Amit's fearsome appearance and the composition nature of her form embodied the complexity of the human soul. So we're looking into a bit more of the reasoning behind she was who she was. The crocodile, lion and hippopotamus each represented different aspects of life. The primal, the fierce and the elusive. In Amit's essence, these elements coalescent coalescend to create a divine arbiter of morality. I can get my words out. We also found out in a previous episode that these are also the three main predators to humankind in ancient Egyptian. These were the three main man-eaters um, of the time. So there was extremely fearful. According to ancient myth, it was believed that Amit patiently awaited in the hall of Ma'at where the hearts of the departed were weighed against the feather of truth. Those with hearts lighter than the feather were deemed worthy to enter the eternal paradise of the afterlife. However, those whose hearts were heavy with the weight of misdeeds faced the terrifying prospect of Amit devouring their essence, condemning them to oblivion. We mentioned this before, it isn't like the Christian belief of hell where it's eternal torment you literally just went into non-existence you you that was it you was done gone so amit's creation myth reflects the profound interconnectedness of life death and the cosmic forces that govern the egyptian understanding of the universe her presence in the afterlife mythology served as a pertinent reminder of the importance of living a just and virtuous life in preparation for the ultimate judgment. So again, she wasn't seen as negative or positive. You know, if you was good, you didn't get to meet her, but she'd also help you. But if your heart was heavy with the burden of your misdeeds, then you were a goner. So now let's dive into some myths that surround Amit and the fearsome creature who, as we said, the head of a crocodile, the front legs of a rhino, a lion even, not a rhino, and the hindquarters of a hippopotamus. So I've got another quote here and it's from the Egyptian Book of the Dead and this is the translated version by E.A. Wallace Budge. So in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, Amit is prominently featured as the guardian of the scales of judgment in the afterlife. She patiently waits to devour the hearts of the deceased should they fail the crucial test. And this is again what gives her that nickname of the devourer. So Amit did play a pivotal role in the ancient Egyptian concept of afterlife, particularly during the judgment of souls. She stood behind she stood beside the scales of Ma'at, where the hearts of the departed were weighed against the feather of truth. And again, I've got another reference book here, and this is from the Oxford History of Ancient Egypt by Ian Shaw. So Shaw explains, quote, The ancient Egyptians believed that the heart contained the essence of a person's character. The heart was found to be lighter than the feather of Ma'at, the soul was deemed worthy to enter the blissful afterlife. However, should the heart be heavier due to a life filled with wrongdoing, Amit would consume it, condemning the soul to eternal oblivion. End quote. So we can back up what we've said with some of these books. And I feel it's important to add sources, be it online or books where you can um, 
and it also means that you as the listener can go out you can look at these books grab one from a library or you can look online um, some of these passages are you are able to find online and you can go into more depth with what I'm saying so despite her fearsome role Amit was not widely worshipped however a presence in Egyptian religious practices is evident throughout various artifacts and illustrations so she wasn't one of these gods that everyone worshipped she's one of these lesser deities that was necessary to a process Amit, the goddess of judgment in ancient Egyptian mythology, was not a deity who received widespread worship, like some other gods and goddesses in the pantheon, that her significance was primarily linked to the afterlife and the judgment of souls. So she had a purpose, but she wasn't praying to her or doing religious practices to her, wasn't necessarily going to get you in the good graces into the afterlife it was one of those she you know she couldn't be bribed bribed even um she was judging you you know she was just guiding actually what judged you you know the scales um so there was no reason to worship her respect her rivera obviously um but you know, Anubis was that one that was going to definitely help you in the underworld. So, despite not having dedicated temples or festivals, just said, Amit is prominently featured in Egyptian funerary arts and texts. And her iconography is distinctive, reflecting her composite nature, which she is. She's like one of the Egyptian deities are found with the most different body parts of animals. So we just go on again to elaborate that she does have this head of a crocodile, bits of a lion, bits of a hippopotamus. <laughs> and it is that combination of the fierce animals, these are the man-eaters that symbolise the elemental forces that could bring chaos and destruction. After all, if you your heart was heavy, you was going into oblivion and Amit was taking you there. In artistic representations, Amit is commonly depicted standing near the scales of judgment in the Hall of Ma'at. Her presence served as a visual reminder of the consequences awaiting those hearts heavy with wrongdoing. The artist conveyed her fearsome appearance to emphasise the severity of the judgment process. So while Amit did not have dedicated festivals, her significance in ancient Egyptian worldview is evident through her inclusion in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. This collection of funerary texts guides the deceased through the afterlife, underscoring the importance of moral conduct and the consequences of an unjust life. And I'm not going to go through it again, but you know, they believed in following those principles of Ma'at. Um, of those 42 confessions, kind of like the biblical commandments of what you should live your life by and aspire to be. Amit's role was more aligned with the individual's personal journey into the afterlife rather than the public worship. The ancient Egyptians believed that living a righteous life was essential to passing the judgment of the afterlife as overseen by Amit and the scales of Ma'at. In summary, Amit's worship was indirect and intertwined with the broader Egyptian beliefs about the afterlife. Her iconography, though not as prevalent as some major deities we've mentioned, played a crucial role in emphasising the importance of morality and ethical conduct in the context of that divine judgement. So we do have... Uh, another source here and it's the gods of ancient egypt by barbara watterson and quote amit was not a goddess of festivals or temples but her image was commonly included in funerary art emphasizing the egyptians intense focus on the journey to the afterlife 
the importance of moral conduct and one's earthly existence, end quote. And again, it's just backing up what I'm saying here and my interpretation of, you know, what I'm reading. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the legacy of Amet extends beyond ancient Egypt, influencing artist representations and even appearing in popular culture. And I'm going to go back to it and you'll understand why I love it. Marvel's Moon Knight. Nerf, Marvel want to send me merch, please. Um, and Amit and Konshu have this massive battle in it, and it's amazing. And you know, she you really do get the sense that she isn't fighting for good, she isn't fighting for evil, she is a presence there, and it's nice to see her in popular culture like that, especially since she's a very much a lesser known deity. So Amit, despite not being that deity that's widely worshipped, left a lasting legacy in ancient Egyptian mythology and continues to capture the imagination of those interested in the culture and beliefs of ancient Egypt. So a few of her legacies here I'm going into and it's there's some primary roots and these are some of the aspects so the symbol of moral consequences is one of the legacies Amit serves as a potent symbol of the consequence of a moral compromise life in Egyptian mythology her presence in the afterlife narrates narratives even underscored the importance of ethical conduct and righteousness during one's earthly existence and that's lasted today. She also has that artist representation and Amit's distinctive iconography. As we've mentioned with the combination of the crocodile line and hippopotamus, I've said it so many times, you're not going to forget the three animals she's made up of. <laughs> this made her a unique and memorable figure in Egyptian art. Her portrayal in funerary scenes and Book of the Dead illustrations reinforce the emphasis on moral judgment and the pursuit of an honourable life. And even if you don't remember Amit's name, you will definitely remember there is a deity there made up of three animals. And the mytholo mythology, there we go, I'll get the words out, surrounding Amit likely served as an educational tool for the ancient Egyptians. The stories of divine judgment and the consequences meted out by Amit would have been used to impart society values, emphasising the significance of justice and moral behaviour. So again, she could be used as a positive, she could be used as a negative. You'd be a little sod and, you know, Amit's going to devour you into oblivion. So she does also have some contemporary significance. While ancient Egyptian religious practices have long been dormant, Amit's legacy and symbolism continue to resonate in contemporary culture and artist expression. So a few bits we'll just go over again. So literature and popular culture. References to Amit can be found in literature and popular culture that draws inspiration from ancient Egyptian mythology. Her fearsome persona and role as the judge of the dead make her a compelling character in modern storytelling. Again, I've mentioned Moon Knight and there's the comics and the graphic novels and all of that shabam. And for the art and design aspect, um, its unique and visually striking appearance made her a popular subject in art and design both in traditional and digital mediums, artists often draw upon her composition form to create visually captivating representations. And again, she is one of the few deities that has an amalgamation of different animals merged into one being. And my voice has changed again. <laughs> Getting full spectrum of Sarah today. She's also used as a symbol of judgment in broader discussions of judgment, morality, and consequences. 
Amit's image or name may be invoked to symbolise the severity of facing the repercussions of one's actions. While not a deity with an active contemporary following, which she doesn't have if you may not have heard of her before this podcast, Amit's legacy and Jaws as a symbolic representation of the ancient Egyptian beliefs in the consequences of life lived with moral integrity or the lack thereof. Her image continues to be a powerful reminder of the cultural and religious complexity of ancient Egypt. So we do have another source and it again is from the complete Gods and Goddesses of Ancient Egyptian book by Wilkinson. So a quote, Amit's role as the arbiter of justice in the afterlife has left an indelible mark on the Egyptian mythology, serving as a powerful reminder of the importance of moral integrity and the ethical behaviour in the face of judgment, end quote. So, I'm going to continue um, on, and that is my piece done with Amit. We will possibly come across her in um, a few more instances, because I'm now going to go on to the aspects of the afterlife, and what are the ancient Egyptian beliefs of the afterlife? and some of the significances and places within that. So the ancient Egyptians' beliefs about the afterlife were intricate and played a significant role in shaping their religious practices and funeral rituals. So I've got some key aspects here of their beliefs, um, along with some, again, relevant sources. Um, I might not go into too much detail with them, but you'll, again, all in the description I will put some of the sources I've used. So this source is the Ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead which can also be known as the Book of Coming Forth by Day and it broadly is, because I haven't mentioned it before, a collection of spells and rituals guided the deceased through the afterlife journey. So it's your how-to get to the afterlife kind of book. So the Egyptians believed that after death the soul underwent a perilous journey through the Duat. And I will go into the Duat and what that is in a bit more detail further in. And that is the realm of the dead. The soul faced various challenges and obstacles including the judgment of the heart before reaching the final destination. So again, from the Book of the Dead and various funeral texts, in the afterlife the soul had to undergo a judgment in the Hall of Ma'at. The heart of the deceased was weighed against the feather of Ma'at, who, as we know, is the goddess of truth and justice. So if your heart was lighter than the feather, the soul was deemed righteous and could proceed to the afterlife. Um... And, you know, Ma'at is important in this as well as not only was it the personification of those beliefs, but she had a lot more going on in the afterlife as well. And the importance of her can be seen in various inscriptions and religious texts, including one called the Instruction of Amenemoth, her, if I pronounced that correctly. So, living in harmony with Ma'at, cosmic order and balance was central to a successful afterlife. Ma'at represented truth, justice, and cosmic balance. Individuals were expected to live ethical lives to align with Ma'at's principles. And again, there is an episode, I think it's the first episode, where we go over those. Uh, episode one, if you want to know more. We also have in the underlife and this afterlife journey Osiris and the Field of Wit reads and it wouldn't be a podcast about the afterlife without Osiris being there. So this information comes from Pyramid Texts, Coffin Texts and the Book of the Dead. So Osiris, the god of the afterlife and resurrection, 
played a crucial role. The righteous dead aspired to join Osiris in the afterlife. They hoped to reach the field of reeds. Again, I'll go into more detail of that. A paradise where they would enjoy an eternal existence in peace and bliss. It's also the aspects of mummification and funeral rituals. And again, there's a lot of sources for this. There's archaeological evidence of mummies and the tombs inscriptions. You know, we know quite a bit on these funeral practices by the evidence found. So mummification and elaborate funerary rituals were performed to preserve the body and ensure a successful journey to the afterlife. Tombs were filled with provisions, personal belongings and religious texts to aid the deceased in the afterlife. So there was also offerings and rituals for the deceased as well. Um, and I think we see a lot of this, um, especially with Pharaoh's tombs, where they find lots of funerary gifts um, and things they believed the pharaoh was going to need in the afterlife. So family members and priests regularly made offerings of food, drink and incense at the tombs to sustain the spirit of the deceased and we've been into this before with the car and bath. Rituals were performed to maintain a connection between the living and the dead. It was basically um, you know, to remember them, keep that, if I get it right now, bar um, sustained. Um, I also see aspects of um, Mexican kind of Day of the Dead type things where they offer food to remember their ancestors as well. So it wasn't only ancient Egypt, it was widespread and still continues today does offering of food and gifts. These beliefs were integral to the ancient Egyptian worldview and shaped their daily lives, religious practices and funerary customs. The sources mentioned, particularly the Book of the Dead, offer insight into the complex and multifaceted nature of ancient Egyptian beliefs of the afterlife and it is an absolutely fascinating book and if you get a chance to have a read of it really take it in and absorb it. The ancient Egyptians held elaborate and intricate funeral practices designed to prepare an individual for the afterlife. These practices aim to ensure a successful transition to the next world allowing the deceased to navigate the challenges of the journey and enjoy a favourable existence in the afterlife. So here are some key aspects of how an ancient Egyptian was prepared for the afterlife. So we're going to go into mummification first. Um, and mummification was a central element of preparing the body for the afterlife. The process involved removing internal organs, preserving the body with natron, a natural occurring salt mixture, and wrapping it in linen bandages. Um, I probably should have said this before, but trigger warning, we are on about death and the body here. So, the purpose of mummification was aimed to prevent the decay of the body, which was considered essential for the soul's continued existence in the afterlife. They needed to have a shell to come back to um, every night to then be reinvigorated and reborn, in a sense, in the morning. So, mummification in ancient Egypt was a complex and intricate process aimed at preserving the body for the afterlife, as we said. The process varied over time and depending on the individual's social status. But here I do have the process of a typical um, mummification. So again, trigger warning if you don't want to hear about this, um, probably best to skip. Um, if I have chance, I will put timestamps on um, where to skip this. So the body was washed with water from the Nile, a symbol of purification, and cleansed of all the impurities even and contaminants. Next, organs believed to decay quickly were removed to prevent decomposition. This process is known as evisceration. The brain was often extracted through the nose using special tools, which I'm pretty sure we've all seen the hook and we've all done about the Egyptians removing the brain. 
after, while the internal organs, so the liver, lungs, stomach and intestines were removed through an incision in the left side of the abdomen. And some of these, um, some of them were put in canopic jars as well. So the natron treatment. So the body was covered and packed with natron, a natural occurring mixture of sodium carbonate and sodium bicarbonate found in dry lake beds. Natron helped to dehydrate the body, inhibiting bacterial growth and preserving tissues. So again, ancient Egyptians were already into this preservation um, science, as you will, you know, going back thousands of years. They knew about this. So the body was sometimes stuffed with linen or other materials to restore it to its original shape. And again, this would depend on your social status. So missing or damaged body parts were reconstructed using materials such as linen, wax or wooden substitute. So they really were effective at, you know, mortuary practices and the morticians thousands of years ago, although a bit of a primitive to today were the forefathers of modern reconstruction in mortuary practices. So the body was anointed with oils and resins to further preserve the skin and impart a pleasant fragrance. As you can imagine, we're hot, we're in Egypt, the smell isn't going to be the best. So, rituals and prayers were recited during these processes to invoke divine protection and blessings for the deceased. So there was, as you're going through this, um, prayers to say, there was even probably Heka involved in it as well. So after all of this had happened, the body was carefully wrapped in linen bandages. Amulets and charms were often placed between the layers of bandages to provide protection and guidance in the afterlife. The wrapping process could be highly elaborate with different layers and intricate patterns. And you can see it if you do ever see any of the mummies in any textbooks online or in the flesh at museums, you, you can see the different way mummies have been wrapped. And it also depended on which time period they was getting wrapped. So a funerary mask often made of Carthage or gold was placed over the face of the deceased. The mummy was then typically laid inside a coffin which was often adorned with inscription spells and protective images and I think the most famous um, funerary mask is that of Tutankhamun, um, the big elaborate gold mask. Just, I mean not everyone was buried with that but it gives you an idea. They had, you know, there was elaborate. So the completed mummy, now wrapped and adorned, underwent final rituals. These rituals included the opening of the mouth ceremony, and I will go more into that, where symbolic gestures were performed to restore the senses and faculties of the deceased for the afterlife. So the entire mummification process was conducted by skilled embalmers and priests. The level of detail and the materials used in the process vary depending on the individual's social status and resources available to them because it, like the religion, the practices evolved over the time. Mummification was not a universal practice but was more common among the elite and those who could afford the associated costs because as you can imagine, you've got the environment, you've got the priests, you've got the materials, it's not cheap. The belief is the preservation of the body was closely tied to the Egyptian concept of the afterlife and the importance of a recognisable and intact form in the journey to the Duat. So we're going on a little bit now about funeral rituals and prayers and it is only a little section. Family members and priests regularly did make offerings at the tomb including food, drink and symbolic representations of wealth. Priests and family members recited prayers and incantations to invoke the protection of deities, especially during the burial ceremony and sequential um, rituals. They did, they did a lot of this. 
So, I am going to go on a little bit now um, about the Book of the Dead. So, the deceased often had copies of the Book of the Dead buried with them or inscribed on tomb walls. This collection of spells and rituals guided the soul through the afterlife journey. That's where I was there. Um, providing instructions on how to overcome challenges and maintain a favourable judgement. You know, which we all need. Um, it is, I, I think, whenever I think of the book of the dead, I always think back to Beetlejuice, which reminds me. Second film coming out this year, I can't wait. And um, the book, A Guide to the Recently Departed, um, I can't remember the exact name of the book. Um, you know which book I'm on about, you know, they get it given to them. Always reminds me of the Book of the Dead. It might even be modelled on the Book of the Dead for a line there. Anyway, I digress back to the Book of the Dead. The spells included prayers for protection, guidance and rituals for faster, passing through various stages of the afterlife. So, let's look at a comprehensive guide now to understand the important ancient Egyptian funeral texts. So the Book of the Dead emerged during the New Kingdom, so this is around 1550 to 1070 BCE and continued to be used in various forms for centuries. It did serve as a guidebook for the deceased, providing instructions and spells to navigate the challenges of the afterlife journey. So the Book of the Dead consisted of a series of chapters or spells, um, with over 200 in some versions of it, each serving a specific purpose in the afterlife journey. The spells were often accompanied by illustrations or vignettes depicting scenes from the afterlife. So you have that visual representation in them as well. Um, as well as the written um, spells. So central themes around this book included the concept of Ma'at, representing truth and justice, and the judgement of the deceased heart against the feather of Ma'at. The book also does invert the protection of Osiris, the god of the afterlife, and includes prayers to various other deities for guidance and assistance. So there'll be Anubis in there, Ra, um, I mentioned Osiris, but, you know, there'll, there'll be a few in there. So, oh, spell 23 is the famous opening of the mouth ritual, symbolising the restoration of the deceased senses and faculties. Um, some other unknown spells, spell 125, known as the weighing of the heart, describes the judgement scene where the heart is weighed against the feather of Ma'at. Um, there's a spell for the deceased identity, which is spell 30, and it's the spell for not letting the body of a man decay in the tomb, and this emphasises the preservation of the body. Book of the Dead was not written by a single author, but it evolved over time with contributions from various scribes and priests. And I think a modern equivalent, and I always bring up the parallel because it is religion, is the Bible where you've got different books and different chapters added. You know, you've got the Old Testament, the New Testament, you've got the Psalms, um, you've got other bits that have escaped my mind, but it may have been collated by one person but there was many different authors and it has evolved over time. So, copies of the Book of the Dead were often personalised for the deceased with specific spells chosen based on the individual beliefs and circumstances. So not only was there no single author, if one spell wasn't relevant to the deceased when they made their Book of the Dead they wouldn't include it. Um, it would just be highly personalised. So copies of the Book of the Dead were often buried with the deceased, contributing to their preservation. Different versions did exist, such as the Phoebean and Sate recensions, 
each with variations in the content and emphasis. So, the Book of the Dead reflects the rich religious and cultural beliefs of ancient Egypt and influenced later religious texts and practices, as we've mentioned. Its spells and concepts signif significantly shaped Egyptian funeral practices, emphasising the importance of a well-prepared soul for the afterlife journey. They wanted this person to go to the afterlife, to go to the field of reeds, they wanted everything ready for them. Several translations by Egyptologists like E. A. Wallace Budge, who we've mentioned previously, and Raymond Faulkner have made the content accessible to modern readers. Yeah, it's not in English, not in Arabic, you know, some of it's in hieroglyphics. The Book of the Dead remains a subject of academic study, providing insight into ancient Egyptian religious beliefs and practices. Because it is such varied and personalised, you can't just study one and aim to understand every book of the dead. You know, there needs to be that broader range of study. Understanding the book of the dead requires an exploration of its individual spells, their symbolism and their cultural context in which they were written. The text is a testament to the intricate beliefs and preparations the ancient Egyptians made for the journey into the afterlife. There's also the burial with possessions. So ancient Egyptians believed that the deceased would need personal belongings and provisions in the afterlife. Tombs were filled with items such as furniture, clothing, jewellery, and even model servants, which referred to as Ushabits, I hope I pronounced that right, to serve the deceased in the afterlife. Also in there, the deceased, as we've mentioned previously, were adorned with amulets, small charms believed to provide protection. So some common amulets include the Eye of Horus, the Ankh, the symbol of life, and scarabs, which we again we've mentioned in a previous um, podcast. So I'm now going to go on to the opening of the mouth ceremony. So this ritual depicted in tomb reliefs aims to restore the senses and faculties of the deceased in the afterlife. So what would happen? A priest representing Anubis or another deity would perform symbolic gestures and rituals to open the mouth and eyes of the deceased, allowing them to partake in offerings left in the tomb. So the opening of the mouth ceremony was a crucial ritual in ancient Egyptian funerary practices, specifically during the burial process. This ceremony was performed to restore the deceased senses and enable them to partake in the afterlife. So again, we're going over an overview of the opening of the mouth ceremony. So the primary goal of the opening of the mouth ceremony was to revitalise the deceased faculties, symbolically restoring their ability to see, breathe, eat and speak in the afterlife. Ancient Egyptians believed that without this ritual, the deceased might not be able to fully experience the afterlife or interact with the gods as we previously mentioned, they go up to that higher status of where they can interact with gods in the afterlife. The ceremony was typically conducted by priests, but family members or designated mourners might also participate. Ritual instruments and objects were used, including a ceremonial adze, a symbolic tool representing the cutting of the mouth and the opening of the mouth instrument resembling a ceremonial knife or utensil. The ritual began with purification and preparations ensuring the purity of both the deceased and the ritual participants so everyone would be cleansed, washed down. Ritual objects, especially the opening of the mouth instruments, were consecrated with water, natron and other purifying substances. The priest or officiant touch the mouth and eyes of the deceased using the opening of the mouth instrument symbolizing the restoration of these sensory functions. A symbolic act breathing air 
or a breath of life into the deceased's mouth, signifying the restoration and breath of life. The ceremony invoked divine blessings, particularly from deities associated with the afterlife, such as Anubis and Osiris. Anubis, the god of mummification and the afterlife, was often invoked during the opening of the mouth ceremony, emphasising his role in the transition to the afterlife. And sometimes um, priests would wear the Jekyll head dress to symbolise Anubis. Scenes of the opening of the mouth ceremony were often depicted in funerary art, including tomb paintings and relief carvings. These depictions symbolised the deceased's successful preparation for the afterlife journey. The opening of the mouth ceremony was closely integrated into the burial process, often taking place at the tomb or burial site. It was typically performed before the final sealing of the tomb or the placement of the mummy in the sarcophagus. References to the opening of the mouth ceremony can be found in various funeral texts, including spells from the Book of the Dead, which we've previously mentioned. The significance of the ceremony continued in the belief systems and funerary practices of later periods. So, in essence, the opening of the mouth ceremony reflects the intricate religious beliefs of the ancient Egyptians, emphasising the importance of ritualistic preparation for the deceased's journey into the afterlife. Now come on to the weighing of the heart. The deceased believed that their heart should be weighed against the feather of Ma'at in the Hall of Judgment. Living a virtuous life, following Ma'at and ensuring a light heart were crucial aspects of preparation for a positive judgment in the afterlife. The weighing of the heart ceremony, also known as the Judgment of Osiris, was a pivotal event in ancient Egyptian religious beliefs. So this was, you know, more important then the opening of the mouth, although you needed the opening of the mouth to be able to speak your truths. It was central theme in the mythology of the afterlife, it played a crucial role in determining the fate of the deceased in their journey to the next world. So here's an overview of it. The ceremony took place in the Hall of Ma'at, presided over by Osiris, the god of the afterlife. So no mere mortal witnessed this. This is all done in the afterlife. The primary purpose was to judge the moral worthiness of the deceased and determine their fate in the afterlife. The heart of the deceased was weighed against the feather of Ma'at, representing truth, justice and cosmic order. So to prepare for this, the deceased underwent mummification and various funeral rituals to ensure the preservation of the body preparation of the soul for the afterlife. The ceremony occurred, as we've said, in the Hall of Ma'at, a mythical hall where the judgment took place. Osiris, the god of the afterlife, presided over the ceremony, while other deities, including Anubis, Thoth and Ma'at herself, were often depicted as participants. The heart of the deceased, believed to contain the essence of their deeds and morality, was placed on one side of the scale. On the other side of the scale was the feather of Ma'at. The balance was expected to be perfectly even for the deceased to be deemed worthy. If the scale remained balanced, indicating the heart was as light as the feather of Ma'at, the deceased was considered just and righteous. If the heart was heavier, symbolising a life filled with wrongdoing and moral transgressions, the scale tipped and the consequences were dire. A balanced scale meant the deceased could be proceed to the blissful afterlife, often symbolised by the field of reeds. An unbalanced scale could lead to the heart being devoured by the monstrous goddess Amit, who we mentioned earlier, resulting in the annihilation of the soul. Scenes depicting the way of the heart ceremony were common in tomb paintings, um, illustrations and funeral papyri, reliefs and reliefs on sarcophagi. These representations conveyed the importance of moral conduct and the consequences of one's actions in the afterlife. 
the weighing of the hat ceremony emphasised the moral imperativeness of leading a just and righteous life, aligning with the principles of Ma'at. The ceremony served as an educational tool, conveying society values and expectations for ethical behaviour. In all, the weighing of the heart ceremony encapsulated the ancient Egyptians' belief in divine judgment and the importance of moral integrity for favourable afterlife. It remains one of the most iconic and symbolic elements of ancient Egyptian funeral beliefs and rituals. These funeral practices were deeply ingrained in Egyptian, ancient Egyptian society and did reflect a profound belief in the afterlife where the soul continued its existence. The combination of the mummification, the rituals, prayers and the use of sacred texts aimed to ensure a smooth and favourable journey into the afterlife for the deceased. The duat is a concept in ancient Egyptian mythology that refers to the realm of the dead, the afterlife or the underworld. It was believed to be a mysterious and perilous realm where the souls of the deceased underwent a journey filled with challenges, judgment and ultimately the opportunity for an eternal existence. So some of the key aspects of the Duat. So the Duat was often described as a vast and earthworldly landscape entered through the western horizon, the place where the sun sets. This symbolised linked the setting sun with the journey of the deceased into the afterlife. So the entrance of the Duat was guided by deities such as Anubis, who played a role in guiding and protecting the souls of their journey. Also in the Duat, um, within the Duat, the deceased had to navigate a series of challenges, including the famous judgment scene in the Hall of Ma'at. The heart of the deceased was weighed against the feather of Ma'at, symbolising truth and justice. Osiris, the god of the afterlife, played a central role in the judgement process, ensuring fairness and justice, basically. The duat was depicted as containing various regions and obstacles that the soul had to transverse. These included demonic beings, serpents, gates and other symbolic representations of challenges and potential dangers. The deceased, the deceased often relied on protective spells and rituals such as those found in the Book of the Dead to overcome these obstacles and it's one reason why it was very important to bury the Book of the Dead with them. In some beliefs, the sun god Ra was believed to navigate the Duat during the night in a solar boat symbolising the cylindrical nature of life and death. The journey of Ra through the Duat also had protective and transformative qualities for the deceased. And we did mention about this journey with Ra um, in the Ra episode. I think that was episode two. For those who successfully navigated the challenges of the Duat and passed the judgment, there was the promise of entering a paradise like realm known as the Fields of Aru. This was a fertile and blissful land where the righteous could enjoy eternal peace. So the Field of Reeds, also known as the Fields of Offerings or Aru, was a concept in ancient Egyptian religion that represented a paradisical afterlife where the souls of the righteous and just could dwell for eternity. This idea was deeply embedded in the religious beliefs of the ancient Egyptians and was closely associated with the concepts of ma'at, judgment, and the quest for an ideal existence in the afterlife. So here's some details about this field of reeds. So the field of reeds were envisioned as a fertile and abundant land, similar to the best agricultural regions along the Nile. It was categorised by lush vegetation, flowing water and fields of green, everything you need there to sustain life. It was a place of peace and tranquility where the blessed souls could enjoy an eternal existence free from the hardships of mortal life. 
Access to the field of reeds was contingent upon the outcome of the playing of the hat ceremony in the Hall of Matat. Souls whose hearts were light as the feather of Matat were deemed righteous and allowed entry. The judgment process was often involved the favour and guidance of Osiris, the god of the afterlife and resurrection. Osiris associated with the field of reeds played a pivotal role in the deceased journey. Again, we've mentioned some of that on we went into Osiris. Souls in the field of reeds were believed to enjoy eternal life. This afterlife realm contrasted with the challenges and uncertainties of their earthly existence prior. The blessed souls engaged in activities reminiscent of their life on earth, such as farming, feasting, and enjoying the company of loved ones. So they, they had purpose in the afterlife. It wasn't just let's all just wander around aimlessly. The concept of the field of reeds reinforced the importance of leading a just and righteous life, according to the principles of Ma'at. Ethical conduct and adherence to moral values were essential for a positive outcome in the afterlife judgment. Motivational aspects of this. So you have the promise of a blissful afterlife serves as a powerful motivational tool for individuals to adhere to society norms and values. After all, they was going to spend an eternity here. Earth was just a pit stop on the way there. Scenes depicted in the fields of reed were often depicted in tomb paintings, funeral papyri, and walls of burial chambers. These images served as a visual representation of the desired afterlife for the deceased. Symbolic elements represented representations of Shazir included images of abundant harvests, animals, and scenes of leisure to confirm well, convey that paradise-like nature of the Field of Reeds. The concept of a paradisical afterlife persisted in later religious traditions and influenced the development of Christian and Islamic ideas about heaven. And again, I've mentioned the parallels to this, and obviously with Christianity, um, when the Romans, Romans even, um, you know, invaded Egypt and took over. They took some of their concepts with their own deities, and then obviously Christianity developed from there. So you can see the influences from ancient Egyptians via the Roman route coming into Christianity. I'm not too confident about speaking about the Islamic ideas, um, so I won't go into that because I don't feel that's right. So the field of reeds was a central component of ancient Egyptian vision of the afterlife, providing a vivid and desirable image of the eternal reward awaiting for those who lived in accordance with Ma'at and possessed judgment of the way in the heart ceremony. And as we mentioned before, the duat was closely tied to the broader Egyptian belief in the cylindrical nature of life, death and rebirth. It was a complex and multifaceted realm, representing both the challenges and the rewards awaiting the souls in the afterlife. The journey through the duat was a central theme in Egyptian funeral belief and practices. And that's it. Um, that's the end of this podcast and this mini-series. I have hope you have enjoyed it all. Um and have found some useful information if not i hope it has just given you something to pass the time with i'm unsure of what the next series will be um but i'm i think i might go back to a bit of true crime um i do enjoy that maybe some historic um crime and people but i do feel with this podcast series i need to have a cohesive even if it's a mini series like this one of where i'm not skipping from real person to mythological to murder to magic i, I feel i should just have a cohesive mini series going on 
Um, so I will take this week to have a look at that. Um, but no, that is it. So, you know, take care my goblets and may your heart be as light as the feather of mine.